All right, we're going to give this a go. Um, up till now, we had things moving through the air. I had no idea how they got started or how they stopped. Um, so now we're going to get into that. It was always like right before impact type thing, find a final velocity. Well, um, the study of what starts and stops motion is called statics and dynamics. Um, it's about forces and how they start things moving, how they stop things moving. Statics is where we have things that really aren't moving, and dynamics is when things are moving. So what kind of forces are there? Your weight. The, the effect of gravity on you is something that we call your weight. Um, if you, there's contact forces. If you push something, you're making contact with it. You're, anytime you're making contact with anything, you're exerting a force on it, and it's exerting a force back on you. That's known, known as a normal force, or we'll get more to that when we do the, uh, the drawings. Uh, if there's rope pulling something, that's called tension. Uh, a force in a rope is called a tension. We'll get to springs, spring forces. There's all kinds of forces out there, but basically we're going to be drawing a lot of pictures so that we can get an idea of direction of forces, who's in two dimensions, which should make you happy. We just got out of 2D motion. It's going to be the same stuff, except instead of having a velocity, a little bit in the X, a little bit in the Y, now we're going to have a force applied a little bit in the X, a little bit in the Y. we got to use sine, cosine, find out how much works in the X, how much works in the Y. And then we'll make our T-chart, same old, same old, X, Y, apply a new formula, and go about the same exact problem-solving techniques so that should make you kind of kind of happy. Whoop. I'll be the first to admit that we went down. We'll get back to that in a minute. All right. Here's something I would normally hand out to you. But we're going to do it right here. All right. Everything that I draw is going to be some something that has mass, and it's going to be a block, a square, or maybe some kind of an object, usually just squares. And we're going to draw all our forces off the center of mass of the object. So we're going to pick a point somewhere in the middle, like right there, and the first two are done for you. And we'll draw all forces off the center of mass. Because if you don't, you're going to start that object rotating. We don't get into rotation until like five, six weeks from now. So everything will be drawn off the center of mass. We're going to, as always, um, start drawing the rest of it. Um, first two are done, and if you look, the the down arrow, which is the weight, you could write W as you label it, or the force of gravity as your weight, is looking kind of equal and opposite to, equal to magnitude, size, opposite in direction, to that force in that string, which we call a tension. And I know they're equal because of this word static. Static means you're not moving. So that's a static problem. We like static problems. If that's true, up and down have to balance. That's going to make much more sense once we start doing the math. But believe me when I say, if it's static, all the forces have to balance. I'm going to go over to number two. And number two, unlike number one, has something that can't fall on the conventional axis system. So if I draw it... That would be my y-axis. We can make that negative y. Make that positive y. I'd rather you just uh, look at this point and don't don't try to duplicate me. Making your x-axis perpendicular to that. You can call that I don't know negative x, positive x. And that's a very convenient coordinate system. Convenient because two of the three vectors fall on an axis so I don't have to do any trig on them. 
I'm not going to get into the trade yet, but you can see that part of that tension is opposing that force because it's static. They got to be equal and opposite. Again, once we get to the math, that'll make more sense. Drop a perpendicular to the y. That component of the tension balances the weight. That's supposed to be a G. It came out awful. Force of gravity. I'm going to go right to black because I'm not going to get into components right now. Just get into a habit of drawing all the forces. If something touches your object, like those two strings, there has to be a force in it. Whoops. Hey, 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 hey. Mm, no, I'll stick with the magenta. There's a tension pulling that way. There's a rope, so a tension pulling that way. And you still have your weight straight down. Weight is one of the four forces that work at a distance. Uh, gravitational force, you don't have to be sitting on the couch to have weight. You have it. Uh, there's three more that we get into, but that's later on in the course right now for you. You don't have to be in contact with something for the force of gravity or the weight to be on you. However, those two strings are touching that rock. So I'm going to label this tension one and this tension two. There's two ropes, two tensions. That's simple. That's all the forces. This is called drawing the free body diagram, which is a start to getting from the word problem to the actual math for you. Drawing a free body diagram. Only free body diagram. Only forces on your drawing. Uh, over here, it's still static. Net force is zero. I can't tell what that is in a minute. Weight down. T2 up. These are different lengths. You don't have to know why yet. T1, that way. Five. Got a rock and free fall. Nothing's touching it. The only thing reaching out and magically grabbing it is gravity. It doesn't have to be touching it, so all you draw is Whoops, weight down. So the net force here is not zero. A net means a leftover force. There's nothing pulling up against it. There's an extra force going down. This one says falling at terminal velocity. So it's reached its final velocity. It's going to maintain that. That means the net force is zero. Don't freak out if you don't know what that means yet. You're not supposed to. Weight is down, force of air resistance. Let's call that F of AIR. You could name it whatever you want. Net force is zero, making them pretty much the same same size. It's a about go about drawing your free body diagrams. I'll get back to finish this after we go through a little bit more of this. So the video you're gonna watch next is of a guy who actually is building an Iron Man suit so he could fly. And at one point, you see him reach out his arms and puts himself in like a tripod position where he's got thrust vectors, and they show them. A thrust is a, is a force vector pushing out, which is kind of lifting his body up. It's pretty cool. I'll be the first to admit that we went down this road really at the beginning for the pure joy of taking on a challenge that was largely thought to be impossible. There was no textbook on how to go and do this. I'm Richard Browning. I am founder and chief test pilot of Gravity, and we build 1,000 horsepower jet engine flying suits. For the last few years, Browning and his team have tested every possible design and configuration they could come up with, all in an effort to make this a reality. The origins of the concept were all around some of the inspiration from my early life. I used to fly model glides and model aircraft with my father. He was an aeronautical engineer. His father was a pilot, so I guess it was in the blood. But fulfilling his dream of flying required real physical demands, too. I spent some time in the Royal Marines Reserve, and the time in the military and all the sports I pursued after that taught me a lot about the capability of the human mind and body. I'm no great athlete, but I did learn a lot about how if you focus the human form on a challenge, whether you want to be an ice skater or a gymnast or whatever, it is amazing how this machine can be adapted. I got to the point with this calisthenics body weight training where I could support my own weight in a number of different kind of unusual positions, like flags, for instance. And I thought, well, if you just replace that hard structure that I'm holding onto with actually a form of thrust, I can hold my body in any number of different kind of flight positions. So as, as ludicrous as that sounded, I thought, well, let's just go and experiment with it. First, he needed to figure out how to stay suspended in the air. 
the form of thrust I landed on was gas turbines. Gas turbines are notorious for being very small form factors, extremely aggressive. And one gas turbine weighs five pounds and puts out about 50 pounds of thrust. So in 2016, Browning started testing different components and variations. And so having experimented with one, we went to two and then went to four and it was getting increasingly compelling. But things didn't always go quite so smoothly. Through lots and lots of trial and error and constantly failing, to be honest, and learning all the time from those safe fails, we got to a point where we managed to achieve a flight, and that was two engines on each arm and an engine on each leg. But there were basic problems at every stage, starting with the decision to have engines on each leg. There's a number of interesting challenges with that model. The problems included the engines being only three or four inches off the ground in terms of the exhaust thrust, the violence of air coming out of those engines at about a thousand miles an hour and hitting even concrete. You could see a smooth concrete surface would start to become pitted from the sheer violence of that air. And yet, as you move them away, the, the violence of the velocity drops off. There was also a challenge with having the engines on the legs in that if you happen to vector your arm engines anywhere near the intakes of the lower engine, we realized that you're in inducted air is going in and that would then spike the exhaust temperature you could see a little puff of sparks and the engine would just shut down so that was another good reason for not having engines down there and finally there's a strange human behavior we learned which is that when your feet feel the ground has, has left them they they almost want to pedal and scrabble around looking for where that surface is that's not helpful when you've got 50 pounds of thrust coming off each leg and those problems led to the solution of actually moving those engines slowly up the body and then consolidating them into one. And essentially that created a skirt all at the same altitude in the body, which could be likened to the three legs of a tripod. There's thrust coming out of each arm and then essentially a third leg coming out of the back of your body, yeah, which provides that uncanny thrust stability. Thrust. Read that for a second. Just taking the yellow force vector, depending on the angle it makes it horizontal, how much it functions in the X, perfectly all of it there, but as the angle to the X grows, you see less of it functions in the X, more of it in the Y, just like we did before, except instead of having a velocity vector there, we're going to have a force vector. <clears throat> This should all make you guys very happy. We're going to take our vectors. If they're in two dimensions, we're going to divide them up using sine and cosine into how much is in the X, how much is in a Y. Make a T-chart. Pick a formula that applies. It's a new formula. We haven't seen it yet. Make it specific to the situation and then do the math. So it's nothing's changed except we have a new force, a new vector to deal with force. We're going to just deal with Newton's first two laws today, really Newton's second law. For this course, for all intents and purposes, if you crossed out the word inertia, <clears throat> excuse me, insert the word mass, you can answer the question. The bigger you are, the harder you are to get moving and the harder you are to stop. So this question pops up off and on on a regions. The answer is A. Speed doesn't matter. It's just how big you are. Okay. I'm going to ask you guys to read that. I'll give you one minute.
okay? <clears throat> That's a lot. You're probably all saying, what is this funny looking E? That's supposed to be an arrow. Well, that's the Greek letter sigma. In the past, we had delta this, delta that. It always meant change in, which was your final value minus your initial value. Well, when you see that, that, that funny E sigma, it means sum all that stuff up. So when you had delta, it was final minus initial, initial. You see sigma, it means add up all the forces. Another way of saying it is the net force. To see if there's a net leftover force. Once I show you a couple of examples, you're going to get it. Key things to remember here. Second bullet. If you add up or sum up or sigma up all the forces and you get a zero, the sum of the forces, the net force is zero. <coughs> I love this word. That means you have balanced forces. That means whatever's pulling to the right has to be equal and opposite as what's pulling to the left and whatever force is going up has to be equal in magnitude and opposite direction to the forces going down that's huge that means there's no acceleration if the sum of the force is equal zero can't really change your mass unless you go on a diet then your acceleration must be zero if your acceleration is zero I can make a nice kinematic equation about a kinematic question about this and the nice thing is that there's only one formula applicable v equals d over t every other one has an a in it but a is zero so it doesn't apply so balanced forces mean a lot to you because life just got easy all right if there is a leftover force leftover 10 newtons to the right leftover 11 12 13 doesn't matter to the right left that means you're going to be accelerating You'll have a value here. Let's, I'm making this up. Five newtons to the right. If the object had a one kilogram mass, what's the acceleration? Well, the acceleration would be five meters per second when you solve for a second squared. I'm sorry. It's okay. If it's not accelerating, however, that means the sum of the forces is zero. It's actually two situations I like to think of. Either you have a velocity equal to zero, it means you're not moving. Or, you have a constant velocity problem. It's really the same thing. Constant velocity of zero, constant velocity of it here. You're static. Here, you're dynamic. You're actually moving um, at a constant velocity. Okay, I'm going to put the first problem up. You guys got... 30 seconds to draw it. Just just draw it on the whiteboard in front of you. Best you can, put a dot in the middle of the box representing the 5 kilogram mass and do a free body diagram. Draw all the forces on that dot. Go. You got a minute. join in <clears throat> there we go horizontal surface there it is I got a little box on it there it is dot in the middle representing this center of mass right there so I don't start turning this thing first things first let's draw a convenient coordinate system I'm going to say conventional because if it moves 
it's going to move on a horizontal axis. We'll call this the positive x, negative x, positive y, negative y. All right. I'm going to draw right down there the weight, which is the force of gravity. You can always draw that on Earth. We're going to know what that is. Now, let's be specific. A very specific application of Newton's law where F equals MA. If you replace that A with the acceleration of gravity, we give that force a very specific name. The force of gravity or your weight. You'll see me start to do this. Just draw MG. It's a habit of mine. Any of those three is fine. W, F sub G, or MG, acceptable. You'll just see me do MG a lot. Now, if you're not crashing through that surface, there's got to be a force up and against you that's equal and opposite to you. We call that the normal force. That is respond, the response of a push. You lean against the wall, the, long, the wall pushes back on you because of the structure of it. That's called the normal force. So I'm going to put big N. Big N. Some books say F sub big N. I don't care what you use. Just be consistent. Or not. I don't care. Just N or F sub N. Thing to remember. That the normal force is always, always perpendicular to the surface. So I'm drawing my perpendicular thing there. If that surface tilts, that normal force tilts. So it stays perpendicular to the surface. The word normal in physics and the math I grew up with meant perpendicular. And I forgot the data already. I think it's a five kilogram mass. Five kilograms equals a mass. I think the force on it was 10 newtons to the right. So that's about a fifth of the green and a purple force, or 10 newtons. It's the applied force. I'm trying to draw it relative to the other ones correct in size. So that's it. But all that's happening here, I'm going to go over here and plug in some numbers. Since the mass is 5, and we're going to use 10 for gravity, there is a 50 Newton force pulling down on it. Okay, we've got our drawing. Everything happens to be on an axis. That's great. This first one's pretty easy. There's no sine cosine involved. T chart is our next step. What's going on in my x dimension? What's going on in my y? Now, unless this thing crashes through the surface and this, this problem didn't state that, it's not going up or down in the y. So I'm going to say the sum of the forces in the y equals zero. Opening argument for the y-axis is, whoop, I did it wrong. <laughs> that was supposed to be Y over here. Some of the forces are in the wrong spot in the Y equals zero. The X axis, however, I see there's a leftover 10 Newton, net 10 Newton, so many ways to say it, force to the right. I know it's going to accelerate, so there's some of the forces in the X equals MA. Forces in the Y are going to balance, it's accelerating in the X, so I did some of the forces in the Y equals zero, some of the forces in the X equals MA. Let's take care of the y first. In the y, in the positive up direction, there was something called the normal force. In the x, positive x, there was a... Oops, I screwed up already. We're still in the y. In the negative y, we have negative 50 newtons equals zero. Therefore, the normal force balances the weight. The normal force is also 50 newtons. In the x-axis, in the positive direction of motion, we have a 10 newton force equals a mass of 5 times A. Therefore, the acceleration has to be 2 meters per second squared. Any 10 newton force, I should say any 10 newton net force on a five kilogram object 
will accelerate it at two meters per second squared. That's it, you found the acceleration. Let's build. Let's build. All right. Same problem. But now there's something pulling it to the left. Call it the force of friction, a kid that's pulling it to the left, whatever. But there's something pulling it to the left. I'm going to call it the force of friction. We'll do that in red. So get used to this. Friction always opposes the direction of motion. Always, always, always. So if there's 10 newtons to the right, and I know it was going to the right, and there's five newtons of friction, that's gotta oppose, it's gotta be this way with five newtons of force. Only thing I added to the entire problem was now there's friction involved, it always opposes the direction of motion. This thing wants to go right, it's being pushed right, friction's gonna be left. So friction is going to be negative. It always kind of robs you of your acceleration. So I'm going to erase here a little bit. This, 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 and this. I'm going to go back. I'm going to say, all right. I've got to account for the fact that this friction has, well, notice it does nothing to change what's going on in my y-axis now. It's totally in the x dimension. Even in the picture, it's in the x dimension. So we got to the right, positive 10. Now friction is going the other way, minus 5. That's the only change there is to this entire problem. So now you have a net force of 5 newtons going to the right. Now your acceleration is 1 meter per second squared. If you have an acceleration of... I'm sorry, if you have half the net force, you went from 10 to 5 pushing it, you're going to have half the acceleration. That's really it. So I think people should be fairly happy. It's the same stuff we have been doing. I want to get to one more thing before I call it quits on this. All right. Welcome back to Tech Garage, presented by Advance Auto Parts. Well, now it's time to talk rotors before we put them on our charger, and we got some good ones here. We got the DBA Club Spec T3 rotors, and why am I so excited yeah, about these is. rotors? Well, when we talk about brakes, we need to talk about two things, coefficient of friction and heat transfer. Coefficient of friction, pretty easy. We want a high coefficient of friction between the pad and the rotor. We don't want it to sit there and slide. I can give you a good example. The coefficient of friction is going to affect the heat transfer. So if you just take your hands, put your coffee down, grab your hands, put it together, push really hard like that, and you'll actually start to feel the heat. The harder you push, the more heat's created. That's what brakes are doing. The pads are squeezing the rotor, and we're getting a lot of heat in there. One of the biggest enemies of a brake system is heat. So we got to dissipate the heat. And I'm really excited about these DBA rotors because I want to show you something right here. They have what's called a kangaroo paw webbing inside of these rotors. And this is neat because if you look right here, it's got 60% more heat transfer than the regular slotted rotors here. Even though it's ventilated, heat transfers from a place that has heat to less heat. So what's happening is the air is hitting that, it's transferring to the outside air. You hit the brakes, you get this massive temperature, whew, it's gone to the outside air, brakes are gonna last a lot longer, you're not gonna have a pulsation, you're not gonna have a lot of run out problems. We'll look at that a little bit later. One other cool thing, you see these three markings right here. This is incredible. This is thermal heat paint. And what thermal heat paint does, it change color. So you yourself can go out in the driveway, rotate your tires, or just look through the wheel if you can, and you see these paint colors. And if you look at these paint colors, it actually correlates right here. And this is on their website. You can see here, it's green, and it'll transfer over to white if it's 856 degrees. You get up in the thousand range here, it goes from a red all the way over to a white, starts to go away, the paint goes away. So you can tell if your brake's been heated up pretty good. You might want to change the fluid, it may be time to change the brakes, but you know, it's time to put this rotor on the charger. So friction's a force that robs you of your motion, and it does it with pretty much everything by converting the energy of the object, your car going down the road, into heat and then the heat gets dissipated into the environment and all the forward motion of your car stops and becomes heating up the air around you. Pretty cool, actually.
So let's describe what you're looking at. We've gone from a horizontal problem, which is it's right down there, to a ramp. And you see that the angle between the horizontal and the ramp is increasing. There's a tension, T, in the rope increasing. Normal force is decreasing. The mag magenta vector, P, this was done by a French-Canadian dude, so I guess the letter for, or I guess the word for weight starts with the letter P in French. I don't really know, but that's supposed to be weight. That never changes. The weight doesn't change because you're on a ramp. But how much of it functions producing the normal force is greatest right there. And as the ramp goes up, the tension grows because more of the weight is now pulling against the, the rope. And the normal force is starting to go down, 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 down to zero. So we're going to have to play around with something about this angle because the angle is going to dictate how much of that weight goes into creating the tension and how much of that weight goes into creating the normal force. Now this graph on the right should be fairly uh, familiar to you. As that ramp angle goes up, you see one thing happening now as it goes down, you see tension changing with the sine function. Sorry cosine, no, sine function, and the normal force changing with the cosine function of that angle. One more time. As it goes up, we see tension growing in the string with the sine function of the angle. We see normal force diminishing with the cosine of the angle. So it's just sine and cosine all over again. I'm not going to get into this one. Not for this. Let's go back to notability. I'm going to go to a third page right there. I'll start the drawing. Something's going to be stuck on a ramp. So off to the side. There's my ramp. There's my box. My dot is the center of mass. And off to the horizontal. That's my angle theta. First time you attempt this, don't attempt it. Just look. This is now a video, so you can look back at it whenever you want. First thing we always do, let's just say this is a static problem. That block is stuck there. I'm going to say friction has it stuck there. I'm going to draw my coordinate system. Since if this thing broke free, it would slide down the ramp. I'm going to make that my positive x. Notice I'm now tipping my axes for ramps. It comes in handy, and I'll show you why. That's my negative x. Since the axes must stay perpendicular to each other, whenever I tip my x by, I got to tip my y by. That's my positive y. I'll say this is my negative y. I've taken my Cartesian coordinate system, and I've swung up my x-axis by theta, so I have to swing out my y-axis by theta. So convenient coordinate system right there. Positive x direction in case the friction doesn't work, it's sliding down the ramp, I want to be ready. I'm going to draw a weight. mg. For the surface of Earth, I can always draw that one straight down. Remember, gravity doesn't have to be in touch with you. It's not to pull on you. If you're on a surface, green, I know that there's a normal force, a push of the surface back against gravity, or your weight, I should say. And it's always perpendicular to the surface. Another reason that's convenient, because it falls right on my y-axis. No components. In red, in red, I'm going to put the force of friction. Now, this thing wants to slide down. That means friction opposes the direction of motion. The force of friction has to be up the ramp. Right? It wants to slide down. Friction opposes the direction of motion. Direction of motion is down the ramp. Friction opposes it. We're not moving. Now we have our three forces that are acting on it. The green and the red one. The normal and the force of friction fall on an axis. No components. Mg is two-dimensional. I've got to divide it up into its components. Once again, convenient. Two of the three fall right on an axis. I'm going to redraw my axes over here. We've got the normal force heading up that way. Normal force, we've got the force of friction on an axis heading that way. And 
like I said, if I tip my x-axis up theta degrees, my y-axis used to be straight down, I've got to tip my y-axis out theta degrees. This is also theta. That makes the component in the y-axis, if I drop it perpendicular down, mg cos theta. My component, perpendicular, perpendicular down to this, mg sine theta. Opposing the force of friction, mg sine theta. Opposing the normal force. Oh, that didn't, oh man. That stinks. I'll fix it. mg sine theta down like this. mg cos theta was opposing the normal force that was up like that. So once you redraw it like this and you divide up the two-dimensional force into its two one-dimensional components, you don't have to draw the original force. It's now easy to see that, let me pick a different color, that mg sine theta opposes the force of friction and mg cos theta opposes the normal force. Now I told you it was stuck. If it's stuck, in my x, my y dimension, I can start out with some of the forces has to equal zero. It's static, not moving. Some of the forces equals zero. Both dimensions. Let's take care of my x dimension. I know down the ramp in the direction of perceived motion, you've got mg sine theta. Up the ramp was the force of friction minus the force of friction equals zero. Therefore, in my x dimension, mg sine theta has to be equal and opposite to the force of friction. Now is my second step. Right, step one. Hey, hey, hey. It's not working. Step one, opening statement. Either sum of the forces equals zero or sum of the forces equals ma. It's a static situation, it's gotta be zero. Step two, I make that formula specific to the particular problem, including getting all my signs right. That's the same as we've been doing all year. I'm gonna to jump to the Y, opening argument right there. Now let's make that specific to the situation we said up was positive, so I'm gonna start out with green. The normal force, minus mg cos theta has to equal zero. Therefore, normal force balances mg cos theta. So kind of like the uh, the video of like the tension in the rope growing with the sine component. Instead of having tension up, I had friction that grew with the sine component of the weight and the normal force was growing and shrinking with the cosine component of the weight. And that's how you divide up a ramp problem into its parts, a static ramp problem. Call it a quit there, folks. I hope, I hope this works.